Listen, did you hear it? It is a voice calling. It is the voice that spoke to Moses and led the Israelites through the desert. It is the voice that spoke to David, saying, I cannot be contained in a temple. It is the voice that compelled Jonah to finally go to Nineveh to preach repentance in the streets. Did you hear it? It is the same voice calling us to faithfulness and promising us deliverance and redemption. Let us follow that voice as we worship, and may it transform us to be followers all the days of our lives. Most gracious God, 
giver of all life and good things. We pause right now to give you thanks. We are here in our beautiful sanctuary, a few of us spaced out but gathered nonetheless as your church. And as the sun streams through these beautiful windows, we are reminded of your abundant and overflowing love. How it warms us. It reminds us that we are never alone, that your presence is not only with us, but it is out before us leading us to our best lives. We thank you for all of our individual blessings. We thank you for the gifts and graces of this local church. We thank you for this beautiful community in which you call us to serve. God of justice, as we gather today, you know we are in uncertain times, times of discord, dissonance, disruption, and disorientation. And in the midst of such trials, you call us to neighborly love one another. That means everyone, our black and brown neighbors, our indigenous neighbors who first lived on this land, to those who claim LGBTQ identity, they are also our neighbors to our neighbors, regardless of their documentation, to our neighbors who might be recently unemployed, to our neighbors who might be suffering from the disease of addiction, to our neighbors without health insurance, and all of our neighbors around us who are oppressed or otherwise do not know the fullness of life. Help us reach out as the loving community to embrace them and let them know of your love and abiding presence. We confess, Almighty God, that sometimes we look only at issues and not about people. We have lost the humanity of others, and in the process, we have lost our own humanity. We have looked inward, with self-preservation rather than outward with empathy. As you have taught, we are nothing without each other as we struggle to see as our brothers and sisters live their lives. Fill us with your love that we might remember that we are the community bound in love for you and for one another. It is only through the assurance of your promise of forgiveness, that you help mend each of our hearts and you create us into one beloved community. Forgive us our short, shortcomings and lead us into right paths for your name's sake and for the sake of your entire world. We petition you in your mercy to guide our footsteps to faithfully pursue your call to justice. As we await results of the election in upcoming days, may peace prevail all the people in this nation, and may our democratic process be protected so that we might live freely and that we are free to protect the least of those among us. Giver of every mercy, Give your people a double portion of your spirit today, that we might be guided by her wisdom and held steadfastly in her hope. This we pray in the manner of your beloved child, Jesus the Christ, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our reading today comes from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock, shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. A word from the Lord. Praise Thanks be to God. When I was a young person growing up in Northeast Cobb County, baseball and softball reigned supreme. Now this was before the soccer craze hit, and that has probably become the most popular sport for youth these days, but we would start practicing in the late winter as soon as the frost had passed, and if I made the travel team, I would continue playing all through the summer. Now one thing I vividly remember from my days in baseball and softball was after the game, the coaches would line us up and there we would trot out across the field, hitting the hands of the, the team members of the other team. I guess we were supposed to be congratulating them on their victory, but our hearts really weren't in it. I suppose it was supposed to help us develop character and sportsmanlike behavior, but when you're a kid, and especially after you've suffered a humiliating defeat, the last thing you want to do is parade over there and tell the other team what a great job they did pounding you into the ground. It was a half-hearted effort at best. It was robotic. I mean, just go through there, good game, good game, good game, good game. We really didn't mean it. After all, we just wanted to go get our free Coke and candy bar from the concession stand and head home. At a young age, it's hard to appreciate when other people have talents and skills. And we quickly teach our children to grow up in an us versus them mentality. At that age, we're not mature enough to look at others and appreciate them and value what they bring to the table. We are sore and bitter losers, not wanting anyone else to enjoy the taste of sweet victory that we ourselves had craved. I would like to think that things get better as we grow up, but I'm not sure I can say that with any measure of confidence. We're all so busy defending our own tribes and camps that we rarely have the inclination to sit down with someone who waves a different banner than us. Encouraging the 
diversity in conversation with those we perceive as others, it's not really the same thing as saying, well, we just agree to disagree on all matters. There are some very important matters of morality and ethics that I'm not sure I can say I value your viewpoint. But it also doesn't mean that various perspectives and opinions can't contribute to a tremendous amount of understanding. That is, if we're willing to take the time to invest in having some uncomfortable conversations. We have found here, even at the church, that they can really be quite fruitful. This should be the role of the church, but should is often the operative word. We could read the story of Jonah, and perhaps we could hear it as a story of us versus them. Jonah was a prophet of the northern kingdom, and the Assyrians are their enemies. And later, they would defeat the northern kingdom and send them into exile. But when the early listeners hear this story about God sending Jonah into Assyrian territory, that had already happened. And so when they hear this instruction for him to go to Nineveh, they are on edge. Why would God send one of their own into enemy territory? This would be like God sending Christian missionaries to preach to extreme Islamic or radical terrorist groups before the attacks of September 11th. And then we would hear the story after that had occurred. And it would be really quite shocking. We could read this story and relate to the prophet Jonah, perhaps. We too can be disobedient and sometimes faithless to the calls placed upon us. He is, by all standards, a pretty terrible prophet. And he doesn't match the pattern of the prophets of the Hebrew Bible at all. Most of them, their stories focus on actual prophecies. But the account we have of Jonah is full of his actions, or lack thereof. When we hear this story, I want you to think of it nearly as a big fish tale. It is somewhat fantastical and farcical. Early hearers would have been shocked by him going into enemy territory, but as the story developed, they would have also been amused. It's more literary in form than the other books of the prophets. And because it is so narrative and so humorous, I don't want you to think that it's not important. We must take it seriously. It contains tremendous amounts of truth, even if it is wrapped in a humorous parable. We skip the beginning of the story because I think it's so familiar to us. We grew up hearing the story that God asked Jonah once to prophesy to Nineveh, and instead of going in the direction of Nineveh, he literally goes in the opposite direction to avoid doing what God has told him to do. We probably remember that he ended up on a boat in the ocean, and then a great storm develops around them. Now, ancient mariners were steeped in superstition, and they believed that the gods controlled the weather. They cried out, each one to their own personal gods, while they realized Jonah slept in the hold of the boat. The sailors decided to cast lots to see who had caused this calamity, and the lots fall to Jonah. And so he is tossed overboard, and even he believes that his disobedience has probably caused the storm. When he gets into the sea, it calms. And this disobedient prophet has the effect of bringing this entire crew to believe in God, and they offer sacrifices to Jonah's God. And then we know this reluctant prophet ended up in the belly of a great fish where he continues to cry out to God. This is where the tale gets really crazy, and the early audiences probably would have laughed at it because the fish vomits him up on dry land where God confronts him again to take the message to the Ninevites. The message is one sentence. Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's it. There's no scripture reading. There's no hymn to be sung. There's really no offer of hope. 
It is just one sentence, and in the Hebrew, that sentence consists of only five words. And with him walking across Nineveh, they heard him, they put on sackcloth and ashes, and they turned from their evil ways. Let this be a lesson to us all, that if you all would just listen more closely to the sermons and do what I say sooner, <laughs> they would be a whole lot shorter. I don't see any conversions going on out there, so I guess I'll continue. So today we're going to focus on just what kind of God is it that is being revealed in this crazy tale. The picture paints, about, paints a picture about the nature of God. And this God is persistent, universal, and merciful. God's persistence is shown that no matter what Jonah does to try to escape the call God has given him, God reworks the story so that Jonah cannot escape it. From traveling the wrong direction, to praying from the depths of the sea, to calling out from within the belly of a fish, God is undeterred in achieving what God wants. Even though Jonah is given nearly an impossible task to preach doom to a city that takes three days to walk through, God makes sure that that one sentence sermon is received. God even changed God's mind about overthrowing this large city. That should give us some reassurance as we try to create faithful change right here in our own town. It doesn't take three days to walk from end to end of North Middletown. It's only a third of a mile square, the technical parameters of the city would be really just take us a few minutes probably and hopefully if we were to preach outdoors in our own town we would have a much more hopeful message to our ministry than Jonah. Sometimes I feel like we could scream at the top of our lungs, we could provide ministry and food and fellowship to the community, we could continue to provide a large amount of relief for all of those in need and yet our message would go unheeded. They would not put on sackcloth and ashes or fast. But I do not despair. God still works through our story to transform those who get the message as well as those who will receive it. Maybe I haven't found the right one sentence sermon to change the hearts and minds of our neighbors. This sermon is seven pages double spaced. And I can only hope that we all take away just one little memorable nugget from it. But even I have no control over that. That too is God's spirit at work. This tale also points us to a God who is universal. It would be understandable for the two different kingdoms to despise one another. It's not entirely advisable for Jonah to go there in the first place. If Jonah were from our country, there would be a State Department warning, do not travel there, it is not safe. The Assyrians are known for their brutality. They did all the horrible things that normally happen during battle, but they always took it a step further. They used human skins of their enemies to make tents. They were gruesome tyrants, bloodthirsty savages. But where God intends for salvation to occur is not up to us. Notice that even after the successful evangelism in Nineveh, Jonah is not happy that the Lord has extended mercy to them. This is in chapter 4. He says it is because God is gracious and merciful and slow to anger that he didn't even want to go to Nineveh in the first place to give them a chance to repent. He did not want his enemies to be redeemed. Jonah feels the way some of us do sometimes. That salvation is for those who worship like us, who look like us, talk like us, and live like us. If we can't domesticate God's redemption and keep it for ourselves, we feel a little threatened, don't we? How many times have we ourselves uttered, I hope they get what's coming to them? Just recently, I was watching a show 
I think it was an Unsolved Mysteries or a Cold Case Files, one of those shows I love to watch. And the man was on trial. They get to the sentencing phase of the trial where the family members of the victim get to speak out. This is years after the murder had occurred. And they shouted, I'm a Christian and I know I'm supposed to do it, but I will never forgive you. And one of them yelled out, I hope you fry in hell for what you've done. When our pain is fresh, we feel this way. But hopefully, after time passes and we spend a little bit more time in conversation with God, we're able to move toward compassion, even for our enemies and those who have caused us harm. This is the test of faith. Obviously, it's one for the ages. Jonah doesn't feel the Assyrians should know God's redemptive love. And sometimes there are people in our lives that we feel the same way about. Did we feel compassion towards terrorists after September 11, 2001? No. Did we want redemption for the Axis powers after World War II and all the evil they had done? Probably not. Do we want it for those who have harmed us personally? We would do well to remember how many times in our scriptures God particularly uses foreigners or outsiders to propel what the kingdom is like for others. Last week it was the widow at Zarephath, the Ruth the Moabite. It can be three magi from Persia who visit the child Jesus, or the Ethiopian eunuch who received the word from Philip and was baptized that day. Israel was the first to receive God's blessing, but Israel does not get to control who else God wants to include in salvation. We would also be wise to remember that we are not the Israelites, and those promises were not originally intended for us. It was not until after Pentecost and during the days of the early church that we Gentiles were included into the story. We have adopted these books of the Hebrew Bible because they are the scriptures of our Lord, but we are not the originally intended audience, and we are not the insiders of the faith in these stories. We are fortunate. We are fortunate that God's intention is for all creation to be redeemed. Let me repeat that, that all creation will be redeemed. In the book of Jonah, even the cattle of Assyria repent. We are told that if we are silent on important matters of faith, God will command the rocks to cry out on our behalf. We are fortunate to receive salvation as it is readily poured out for us, but we are not to attempt to control who else receives it. Our faith tells us to rejoice when others know God's love, not begrudge that God has also been merciful to them. These are good words for us right now as we are emerging from a contentious and ugly political season. This season, combined with a politicized pandemic, has revealed who we are as a nation. And I'm afraid God is watching and is none too pleased with us. We have been content to revert to an us versus them mentality. And that's within our own borders. We don't even have to look beyond our nation to find ones that we would readily call enemies. We have seen brown lives and old lives and young lives and poor lives suffer the worst because of this pandemic. We have not been obedient to God's call for justice to protect the most vulnerable among us. We have spoken carelessly and some have acted recklessly. Even in our own neighborhood, we have lawns torn up because somebody posts a political sign that did not agree with somebody else. Like Jonah, we have failed to see others the way God sees them. 
We certainly have not loved one another the way God loves each and every one of us. Maybe, like the Ninevites, we could put on sackcloth and ashes and call for a national fast. We need to hear calls from the prophets to repent, both the ancient prophets, the more recent ones, and those that God has placed in our midst today. I certainly don't know all the answers, and I don't know the entire journey ahead of us, but I do know that we cannot outrun God's plans for us. This God is persistent in pursuing us, is universal in who God wants to save, and is always merciful with love. We might be headed in the wrong direction. We might need to cry out from the depths. But God is not giving up on us despite our half-hearted efforts and our lukewarm attempts at reconciliation. This God will chase us down to the ends of the earth to make sure that we know the plans that are in store for us and in store for all of God's community. We need to emerge from this with spiritual maturity and wisdom. We can no longer be the children playing on the, the baseball field, begrudging one another's victories and giving a half-hearted congratulations to the winner while we go back and sulk about it. We need to learn from one another and to be happy for others' successes. As we mature, we should come to realize once again how interconnected we all are and that a success for one is indeed a success for others. We need to rejoice when other people get a taste of God's merciful and abundant love. I pray that we emerge from this more like the Ninevites than like Jonah who bewitches. Amen. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Loving God, we know that you receive those who seek you. We gathered at this table today, bringing our whole selves to you in an attitude of repentance knowing that you would receive us with an abundance of mercy and forgiveness. Thank you for feeding us with this sacrament. This meal you have blessed us with has restored, revived, and renewed us. It has united us with Christ and has given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal realm. We thank you for the grace we have found at this table. Send us out now with the power of your Holy Spirit to live and work for you and to share Christ's love with the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For those who are worshiping in person, I remind you to please take a moment to fill out your welcome card and also be sure to put the date on it. You're going to collect these uh, and keep them on file for contact tracing, should we need to use that. I hope that we won't. Um, also, take a moment and write on the back of your card your gratitudes. For those worshiping at home, you may say these out loud or write them down, but no matter how you do it, be sure to know that it is your act of worship to pause and give thanks to God for all the blessings that have been bestowed upon us as individuals and as Christ's church. If you're here with us today, I'll point out that the offering plates are there at the exits and you can pick your welcome cards as well as any gifts that you have there as you depart. I just want to remind everybody of the ways you can give, either at in-person worship, dropping it by the church, mailing it to our mailing address, or visiting our church's website. We appreciate any and all gifts and we anticipate God's future blessings. We praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. The next hymn you're about to hear is very familiar. It's based on the church's one foundation, However, there is a poet who writes such beautiful modern words to these traditional settings, and this one I found in some post-election day worship materials. It is by Carolyn Winfrey Gillette, so I hope you enjoy it. It's called In Times of Great Decision.
And now the charge and benediction. And now may you put the teachings of your faith into practice, not for glory, but for love of your neighbors who are vulnerable and oppressed. Finding strength for this work and knowing that your divine parent who created you, the spirit who would inspire you, and the Messiah who teaches you will empower you for all your life.